Ladies and gentlemen in the room and online, good morning to all of you. My name is Christine Pomerantz. I'm the chair of the Department of International Trade and Marketing for the Fashion Industries, known as ITM, which belongs to Fashion Institute of Technology's Jay and Patty Baker School of Business and Technology. ITM is a two-year bachelor degree program that prepares students for management positions in international trade and global fashion companies. Its graduates move on to become coordinators, managers, directors, and executives in global sourcing, logistics, customs, compliance, marketing, management, finance, research, education, and other areas of expertise. I am pleased to welcome you to Luxury Trade, its history and future, as the opening event of its 29th season of the Talking Trade at FIT guest lecture series. Our next event is on the active pursuit of shared value through international corporate responsibility, co-produced by Social Impact Collaborative to be held on Tuesday, November 14, from 6.30 to 8 p.m. at this theater as well. The Talking Trade at FIT guest lecture series, sponsored by the ITM Advisory Board, was launched in fall 2004 when ITM students, now as outstanding alumni, suggested we bridge fashion and creative sectors with classroom instruction by inviting captains of industry to pursue dialogue with students on their areas of expertise. As a result, we have been privileged to host stalwarts like Claudia Casaglione, CEO of Todd's, Patrick Dempsey, group president of Estee Lauder, Craig Levitt, CEO of Kate Spade, Farouk Kathwari, CEO of Ethan Allen, Ellen Iskandarian, President of Women's World Banking, and many other luminaries in their fields. We also wish to acknowledge the presence of our liberal arts uh, colleagues, uh, as well as Professor Henry Welt and his class uh, for this exciting learning experience. Thank you also to the International Trade Student Association who sent a team of volunteers as well as Stacy and our technology team to ensure this event is a resounding success. We are honored to host for the first time at FIT, Mr. Boon Hui Tan, Vice President of Global Arts and Cultural Programs and Director of Asia Society Museum uh, at the Asia Society. And now, to get our program started and to introduce Mr. Tan more, uh, in more detail, uh, I am pleased to welcome my esteemed colleague, Dr. Kyung Hee Pyun, who initiated this collaboration, which we envision to be the first of many to come. Thank you, Christine, um, and thank you for Mr. Tan for coming to FIT. Uh, you couldn't hear very well. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, thank you, Christine, for organizing uh, this event, and uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, Mr. Boon Hui Tan of Asia Society, and it's a great pleasure to have students uh, in my class, Asian Art, Asian American Art and Design, and also students in Professor Welt's class, uh, Global Marketing, of luxury brand. Um, so um, um, today uh, we are going to hear uh, Mr. Uh, Tan's uh, lecture uh, on uh, the Tang Dynasty shipwreck uh, off the coast of Indonesia. And then we will relate uh, to our um, interest in uh, luxury trade uh, in the past and the future. Um, so let's welcome uh, Mr. Tan. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you for coming so early on a chilly uh, sort of morning. Um, thank you, first of all, to uh, Christine Pom Pomerantz, the chairperson of the uh, Department of International Trade and Marketing of FIT. Of course, to Professor Henry Well, the professor in the Department of International Trade and Marketing FIT as well. And of course, to Kyung Hee Kim. Uh, from the Department of the History of Art uh, for uh, inviting me. It's not often that I get to, 
to speak to designers, those who work what in, in what, you know, we when I was growing up, we called the applied uh, arts. Uh, the people, in a sense, who marshal the creativity of of artistic expression into objects that are not only aesthetically beautiful but also, you know, uh, functional. So I'm going to try and make uh, the presentation quite punchy uh, because the topic I'm going to speak about is extremely complex and we don't want to get caught up in all the archaeological uh, debates. Uh, the focus of my presentation really is on using one particular shipwreck, perhaps the most important maritime find in Asia in the last 50 years, which has changed completely what we know about uh, early trade in, in Asia. And early, we mean, you know, ninth century. Um, let's start. We are now living in a world of walls and borders, whether we are talking about actual physical walls on land or invisible waters in the oceans that separate nations. But, you know, if you were an island nation, you realize your border is merely a buoy bobbing on the ocean surface. And there's this imaginary line that suddenly you're in or you're out. Gee, where did that come from? Um, the implication, of course, at the current moment is that the unregulated movement or sometimes even the idea of being possible, that movement is possible. The movement of people or goods or ideas is something that needs to be controlled, to be regulated, and sometimes merely to be stopped. Every day, the idea of free trade invites the intrusion of states and the polices of movement. One of the most vocal justifications of this type of restrictive behavior is that unregulated trade is bad for us. Why is it bad for us? Because it is good for them. That's, that's the actual reason. It's bad for us because it's good uh, for them. Yet, uh, this is where art and history come into the equation for all the examples that we sort of see from history does not bear this out. For in instance after instance, vibrant trading activities go hand in hand with economic dynamism and an efflorescence of cultural development. And the example of early trade uh, in the 14th century in the area that we call wider Asia is a testament to this, particularly as it relates to what we now uh, refer to as luxury goods, or specifically the luxury goods of its time. Things like porcelain, particularly Chinese porcelain, uh, silk, which unfortunately does not survive uh, the, the centuries, gold and silver vessels, and we'll see some of them in the example of this wreck. Uh, just a little bit about why luxury goods historically uh, have been used as a kind of case study. One is, of course, because they tended to be very high value at the time they were made and consumed. And, and because of that, they tended to be the prerogative of the nobility, the elite, the wealthy, the literate. Uh, and so there was a better chance that they would be preserved. They, would, they tended to be much more noticed and recorded. And the creative production usually, like the, the archaeological remains of, of porcelain, of gold and silver tended to be retained to this day as artistic legacies. Hence, they, they are archaeologically and historically a rather good indicator of larger trends within a particular sort of community or state over time. Now, I want to talk about this particular... Okay. In 1998, local fishermen diving for sea cucumbers of the tiny island of the island of Belitung in Indonesia, uh, Southeast Asia, discovered a mound on the seafloor, which was made up of what seemed to be coral encrusted ceramics. The contents of this find, now called variously the Belitung uh, shipwreck after the island in which um, you know it, it was found, or the local name, the Batu Hitam shipwreck. Um, and also variously the Tang treasure because of the period of the find, became a sort of um, landmark example of 
the heights to which you know cultural development as well as global trade had been attained uh, as early as the ninth century. The wreck itself was phenomenally large. This ship carried up to 60,000 glazed bowls, ewers, green, white and green splash ceramics, as well as lead ingots, bronze mirrors, and a small quantity of extraordinarily fine gold and silver vessels. This was, in essence, the largest collection of Tang Dynasty artifacts ever recovered anywhere and carried, extraordinarily enough, in the oldest Arab vessel found in East Asian waters. And why, the other reason why this was such an amazing find was that, imagine it was found by sea cucumber divers. That means it's the wreck, it, the, the find is actually not very deep. It was shallow enough, you know, for, for these divers to uh, sort of find it. And you are talking about one of the busiest sea lanes in the world. So the fact that it laid undisturbed for a thousand years is a sort of mind-boggling uh, kind of uh, situation. Now, it's becoming very clear that trade was much more extensive and much more, in a sense, developed uh, in a very early period. Uh, this is just a sense of the, the kind of trade routes that we are talking about in the sort of larger Indian Ocean area in, in the last, in an earlier sort of uh, millennium. And after the fall of Rome, particularly Western, the Western Roman Empire, essentially the two great civilizations, the two great empires that uh, were in the world were in a sense the Asian empires, the Abbasid Empire uh, in the Middle East, and of course Tang Dynasty China. And I'm not sure how much you know about the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty is very interesting because at some level it is also the least Han Chinese of the dynasties. You know, and and if you look at images of ceramics and pottery from the Tang Dynasty, even murals, you will see lots of examples of what they call foreigners. You know, people with red hair. Uh, <laughs> you know, and hence sometimes in China historically they refer to red-haired barbarians. You know, that's partly where it it came from. You know, because it was very exotic. You know, so it was a very exotic land, and Tang China, because it was very cosmopolitan, it there was a, in a sense, a real kind of obsession with what we now, on hindsight, call fashion. I mean, there were people that would suddenly start one trend, particularly if the royal family, if the king, and particularly if the empress or the imperial concubine were to wear something, and then, uh, you know, everybody would want to to follow it. Huh? And it's, it's, uh, it's, so it was a, a kind of very exciting and slightly crazy time. So there are records even of how, you know, during the main religious ceremony when the uh, relics of Buddha were paraded, were, were taken around the capital annually, you know, you will have people go into ecstasy, women will set their hair on fire, they would be rolling on the ground. So it's a very exciting kind of time and the kind of, of uh, economic activity reflects that kind of very cosmopolitan, very dynamic uh, kind of period. And of course, just a little snapshot, I mean, we won't have time to go into this, that basically a lot of what we know from that period comes from uh, shipwreck finds of trading vessels that were going through that period. And generally, of course, I'm sure everybody knows, you know, China you will produce things like ceramics, silk, which unfortunately does not last underneath the sea, so very little sort of material is found. Tea, of course, and then to China, you will have other sort of things. And you must remember, again, that the Europeans came very late. So this trade persisted until the coming of the Portuguese. And a lot of the uh, kind of trade with China was controlled by the Arabs, essentially, until Vasco de, de Gamo uh, found a route there. You know, and the, the so-called so European spice trade and spice wars began. So this is very, very early, you know, before the 14th uh, century. And this is where 
in essence the uh, ship would have uh, been traveling so it is very likely that the the ship was when it was when it sank it was actually on the return journey so it came from in essence the middle east from the gulf you know it would have hugged the coast of the arabian sea uh, up the bay of bengal down the straits of malacca up to vietnam and to the ports of southern uh, China. Uh, the evidence seems to imply definitely that the final destination was a southern port, particularly the port of Yangzhou, um, right in, in, in the uh, sort of south. That's where the solid line uh, sort of ends. And the. This is a, a reconstruction of the ship by the Omanis government so to speak, of what the ship was. It's a very small ship. The keel of the ship, you know, the length is only about 50 feet. So imagine 60,000 pieces of cargo. Uh, the crew therefore slept actually on the, the deck. There was, absolute, there was probably no space underneath. And, and so all the items were stacked. So it was a kind of engineering feat. Uh, I'll say a little bit more uh, about the ship, but essentially, um, it's likely this Arab ship sailed between the areas, you know, from the Gulf to China during the 9th century. And the route that it traveled, we now refer it to it as the so what we call the maritime silk route, even though it mainly transported ceramic. I think that's because we had the normal silk road on land, so people just imported the same term. The vessel sank, of course, on the return journey, and what is uncertain is, of course, why the vessel was so far from the route. I don't know whether I have a... Ah. So the vessel actually sank here. So normally, you would expect it to hug the peninsula and go this way, but it sort of went slightly off, whether it's because you know it ran into trouble or simply that it was making a side trip uh, because some scholars uh, sort of dispute that it would have been a direct kind of route. It's not like a direct flight that they would have made transit stops to trade. And we certainly know the crew was very multicultural and one of the things that ships would do would be to stop along the way to pick up new crew because some crew will die along the route. It's a very harsh kind of, they were sleeping on deck and you know there were all sorts of uh, issues with health and so on. Um, but so Belitong is southeast of the Singapore Strait. So again, okay, it, it should have gone this way, but it went slightly uh, south. So the possibility is that it could have been making ports of call all along the port cities of the region, making repairs perhaps, or taking on new sailors to replace those who had perished on a long, difficult journey. Or simply that something happened to the ship and it went off course. Wrecks of this age are rare finds, and the Belitung was literally the only, is the only 9th century vessel of that origin found till today. And the ship has given us, the wreck rather, has given us two important archaeological discoveries, its cargo and its hull. The majority of the recovered cargo, 60,000 pieces, con consists of ceramics, most of which are of a form we call Changsha ware. Now, on the ship, and what was interesting about the ship so far is that when, why do we say it's an Arab ship? Because when uh, the sort of timber was analyzed, interestingly enough, um, the timber was found to be of materials such as African mahogany, teak, and African juniper. So particularly African mahogany, as the name implies, is native to Africa. You know, and it indicated that even within the Gulf region, there was a kind of active trading relationship okay, with the African uh, continent uh, itself, particularly the areas now under Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo. However, the stitching, what was interesting is that the ship couldn't have been Chinese because the ship was made without nails. It was made using a technique called sewn plank construction, where literally fiber threads were used to sew the timbers together. 
it's quite extraordinary, you know. So it's literally the ship was sewn together. If you imagine using using a kind of giant needle and thread uh, conceptually, and because of that, it it always needs certain kinds of repairs. And when they analyzed the remains of the ship, they discovered that you know there were evidence of materials that came from Indonesia you know, of local materials. So as they stopped, they would have stopped to make incremental repairs using whatever materials uh, was found. So again, it possibly explained why, in a sense, the vessel was going a little bit uh, sort of uh, south. So now I want to go into the materials in the, the cargo because it's the materials in particular that show, uh, in a sense, the, what was going on between these great, these two great uh, sort of empires. Of course, there was spice. Not so much has, has remained. Star anise, something called star anise, it's originally not as black, as well as small quantities of aromatic resin have been recovered for the wreck. from the wreck. The star anise is thought to have medicinal properties and strangely enough is probably an export item from southern China and the Vietnamese land. So again, you know, indicating that it's probably going back towards the, the Gulf. The materials, particularly the ceramics, show the sort of influence, the sort of inspiration, the way in which uh, the Islamic lands you know, of the Abbasid Empire and Tang China, in a sense, were inspired and influenced uh, each other. We know, of course, that Chinese ceramic, particularly later porcelain, was very important in the Middle East because a lot of the Islamic porters will try and imitate the same kind of glossy uh, white clay body of the Chinese ceramics. And, you know, there have been some scholars who have been looking at, for example, correspondences uh, in the Gulf area. So, uh, I can't remember the exact reference, but there was a reference by a religious leader who was writing to um, his, the leader of his order to say to say that you know I have received these gifts of these amazingly beautiful I think it was uh, vessels which are clearly Chinese porcelain, very thin and translucent and bright. Do you think we could use them for? our religious ceremonies. So they were greatly uh, sort of prized. The largest vessel, ceramic vessel in the cargo is this ewer, which is more than three feet tall and made in the Gongxing kilns of Henan province in the south around 830 AD. The form of the ewer is obviously modeled after Islamic metalware. This is not a Chinese or a Han uh, kind of form and therefore marks the item as a luxury object made for in Middle Eastern taste. Green splash ware similar to these in the cargo have been found in Yangzhou, China, but also in the Middle East at Samara, the one-time capital of the Abbasid Empire, and also in the cities of Siraf and Nishapur. The style, this kind of green splash style, was greatly imitated in the Middle East, though examples from Iran were low-fired earthenware, these are stoneware, coated with white thin glazes to imitate the appearance of high-fired Chinese stoneware. The large size and relatively thin neck, and amazingly, this thing was relatively intact. There was no major sort of uh, breakage. It's a wonder it survived. Uh, meant that actually, at three feet tall, it was too heavy and too unwieldy to be used. So it's probably a luxury item for display, for decorative purposes, you know, to say I am rich, I can afford something so fabulous in my living room. Um, and also, this type of incised lozenge motif is a typical Abbasid design. It's not really a, a kind of Chinese uh, design, which are found on other ceramics, other objects in the wreck, and, and again indicating that probably it's meant for Middle East. So we are beginning to see customization you know, it's not ma it's it is mass production in a sense. The volumes are so huge, but at the same time, they had a clear sense of who was the buyer and the taste of the buyer.
Okay, we are beginning to see this here. And in the 9th century, the green stone wares of southern China and the white wares of the north, like the, those of the Sing Kilns, were the finest ceramics in the world. Uh, it's for two reasons, because only China had that particular kind of white clay, you know, that was really white, that people around the world really loved, especially uh, the Islamic world. And they had a particular kind of wood fire kiln that could fire the kiln above, I forgot what's the Fahrenheit, it's like 1,300 degrees Celsius, so very high uh, temperature. So you could get this very white, very shiny, glossy uh, kind of uh, body. Okay, just to show how they influence each other, as well as you know how the Chinese were adapting to Middle Eastern taste. Which is Chinese, left or right? Which is Chinese? This one. No, this is the Islamic vessel. That is the Chinese uh, vessel. Okay, so you see how they the the same kind of lobed. Uh, thing. I'm sorry, I couldn't get a good picture of the Islamic work, but that one, it, it's not so white. They, they couldn't attain the, the same white. Okay, uh, And the one on the right is probably from Basra as well. Okay, guess again. <laughs> Which one is Chinese? Huh? Right. <laughs> it's Chinese. Okay, that is Chinese, and that, that of course is from Abbasid. And this kind of pattern, okay, is not a Chinese design. Okay, it's definitely not the Han Chinese design. And extraordinarily, what was very unexpected, and it made, I think there's a few PhDs there, is that three blue and white uh, pieces of, of uh, earthenware were found, which immediately put forward the date in which blue and white was found by quite uh, a long, in early, it, it, it became much early. That means by the 9th century, you, you already had. And why only three? The speculation is that these were sample pieces that were made, that were supposed to be brought to the Middle East to the customer, so that the customer can sort of approve the design, and then they would make uh, the it in larger quantities, like with the other kinds of ceramics. And what was interesting, of course, is that for these luxury goods, you imagine it would take literally two years for your order to arrive, and it may not arrive, like in this case, some poor guy you know, lost all his stock, because you, know, you will have to go and then you will have to come back. Okay, the largest proportion uh, of of ceramics were, were actually uh, from the Changsha kilns, these brown glazed ceramics. A lot of them are what we call tea bowls, and, and these are technically what we call stoneware. So of the 60,000, about 57,500 pieces are these. So this is an example, of, again, of mass production, 60,000, but yet every piece, the design varies slightly. So you imagine, even though it was being produced in such quantity, you know, there is variation in all the designs. Somebody had fun, basically, uh, with this work. So that's, that's really kind of fascinating. And you had, you know, I don't know whether it was a taste, you know, suddenly you will have a piece that looks like Chinese calligraphy, but no one can conclusively read this. You had things that look like Islamic calligraphy. So, it, it, you know, you begin to see this sense of really there was a kind of love also for decoration, you know, for using cultural elements as a kind of design motif that, that has no direct sort of relationship to, to its inspiration, you know, it was an aesthetic uh, exercise. So that's quite, and, and it only makes sense when you realise how the quantity of it, you know. So you begin to get the sense that really China was the factory of the world. So what is happening now when we are all where all our clothes are all made in China? It's it's not a new story. This already happened in the ninth century. Huh? Okay. 
One of the most impressive finds in the wreck was the 30 pieces of gold and silver vessels found hidden, and it was hidden away in a, a certain part of the ship. Obviously, it was not meant to be known uh, to, to the general sort of people on the ship that such things exist, and no comparative finds from the 9th century of this type and this quantity of gold and silver really has been found. And the decoration found on the gold and silver vessels is very similar to that found again in the Yangzhou area during from the late 8th century onwards. And the workshops in, in that part of southern China where probably this ship would have stopped uh, would have been producing work for the imperial court as well. So what is interesting is that the, the, the sort of pieces, except barring the decorative elements, you know, they are of the similar quality as what would have been produced uh, for consumption within China uh, by the elite. Okay, so you can see it's really spectacular, the chasing. And what you don't see is, because it's so, why do we know it's so precious? Of course, gold is precious, but why do we know it's so precious? Because on the underside of this vessel, of this plate, for example, the, the artisan had incised, they had carved the weight of this piece because they were afraid people will shave away parts of the gold. So the best way is to carve the weight of the piece so the buyer can weigh the piece when it, it ends. So this is really luxury. We are really entering high-value luxury goods. So the most magnificent find of the gold and silver uh, cash is this octurnal cup that strangely enough has middle central asian figures uh, of a uh, basically what is referred to as the hu people the people of of the um, the non-chinese ethnic group of the northwestern region and they are playing musical instruments this is made of solid gold by the way and from Co comparative examples of Songdian silver created by Tang craftsmen prior to the mid 8th century, that means a century earlier, we know that this cup is strikingly similar. So we're not sure why it, it almost is like a blast from the past, you know, it's strikingly similar to silver vessels you know, of a much earlier period that was created for, you know, a, a kind of, that was found in, in, in Central Asia. And this is an incredibly high value item because we know that the, this, the price of this cup alone would have been 10 years salary for a low ranking Chinese official of the period. So that's how valuable it, it was. And also the fact that it was sequestered away uh, in the hull. So we are talking about a trade that is also driven by immense wealth, as well as you, you had with the, the brown, so you had luxury goods, but you also had, what we say, for the middle classes, these kinds of, of, of brown tea bowls, you know, the, because these were for everyday use, like the gold and silver and the big ewer, you couldn't, the ewer itself couldn't have been used, you know, so it's not an item that you would use daily, whereas this you might, so you, you can sort of, imagine what was going on uh, at that time. Okay, let's go back to that. So I just want to end with saying what, what is the implication from what we understand about trade, that it really marks a turning point in our understanding of global trade in luxury goods and daily items. And some of the, the things that we should note is that one, that the scale of the trade vastly dwarfed the land route, you know, there's a lot of talk and a lot of people know about the silk route, but what is going on in the sea is far, the scale is, is many times more. So you just imagine what a ship can carry and how much a camel can carry, you know, that the comparison is, is sort of meaningless. The other is that even though it was the China trade, in essence, it was also the Arab trade because the ship was an Arab vessel and we now know that the long overseas trade routes were actually dominated by Arab traders. And what I didn't say was, of course, in this whole thing, this is private enterprise, private trade. This is not trade driven by imperial decree. And we know that in the 9th century, the Tang dynasty was sort of in its last legs. So despite a kind of internal political weakness 
you know, in the main producer. This was strangely enough the period of of great trade uh, and cultural expansion. You know, it, despite it being the twilight of the Tang Dynasty, and we know uh, that there were a lot of foreigners you know, who were, as a result of this trade, living in the ports of southern uh, China. And after this period was over, this sort of what we call protectionist period, so to speak, uh, came about, but possibly because of, uh, you know, political struggle within China. For example, the rebel uh, Huang Chao in 879, you know, actually... Uh, slightly after this period, this the most of the items are probably around the 830 uh, AD. So in 879, he sacked the port city of Canton in southern China and actually killed 120,000 foreign merchants. So people were there, non-Chinese were there all over China even in that period. Okay, They were actually living... Uh, there. So the other thing is, of course, the incredible scale and variety of designs in even everyday items like the Changsha, where again indicates again the size and scale of the export ceramic uh, trade in this area. And of course, it also means that the Middle Eastern market was extremely sophisticated at that time. They knew what they want. They could pay for what they want. If they couldn't pay or they couldn't wait uh, long enough for the items to, to come, they would, they would do not parallel import. They would try and imitate uh, the, the, the produce. And hence, you know, that's why it, you had these Middle Eastern um, sort of pieces that were in essence trying to emulate uh, the look of Chinese ceramics. So what does that have to do with trade today in luxury goods. I think we're supposed to do that in the conversation. So thank you, please. And you can ask me any questions. You like. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Tan. So you can oh. have a seat. Uh, and then uh, from now on, we are going to have a little bit of um, discussion like a, in a casual manner. So uh, we have some classes from International Trade and Marketing Department. And uh, we also have a, a class from uh, Liberal Arts. <laughs> Liberal Arts uh, Asian American Art and Design. So uh, we will have some questions from sure. students and also questions from uh, sure. professors uh, of each class. Sure. Um, so uh, have a seat okay. and uh, we will continue our conversation. And if necessary, we can go back to certain slides uh, if, you have a, yeah. if you have any comment on particular work. Um, so, uh, Oh, and then uh, we have a microphone for students. So um, later on, uh, if you raise your hand, uh, somebody will come to you with a microphone. The entire event is uh, video recorded, so uh, we can uh, retrieve uh, <laughs> some other time if so, we are yeah, yeah. So um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Tan for um, introducing the concept of maritime Silk Road, mm. uh, because in, uh, you know, in our school, uh, I created a course, mm. The Art of the Silk Road, mm. yes. and uh, we actually talk a lot about the a nomadic Silk Road mm. uh, in the northern part of uh, China mm. uh, and in Central Asia. Mm. But um, since this Belitung shipwreck was um, discovered in 1998, it yes. has been almost 20 years. Yes. And uh, I know there has been some uh, development yeah. in um, scholarly circle as well in terms yeah. of their research directions, um, other topics. So I want you to um, introduce more uh, about what happened after the shipwreck uh, was discovered. Um, in academia and also in the yeah. museum world. Well, I think in, in general, it, it has rewritten, it has, it has um, stimulated scholars actually to date many things much earlier than we expected, you know, like with blue and white and with, with you know, many of these sort of technical innovations that, that actually things happen much earlier and, and it sort of changed uh, sort of later. And incidentally, the reason why we are able to date this, I mean, among various reasons, but including the fact that there was a bowl that actually has a date of manufacture. So this is very rare for shipwreck. This is probably the only one where you can date it so, so closely to like, you know, the 830 
uh, sort of ADs. And I think what is very clear now, uh, after all the research has been done, is that there was a global sort of trading system that was sophisticated and developed that, that brought together people not only of different geographies, but of different cultures and different religious traditions. And, and somehow through trade of these items, they, they could, in a sense, coexist with each other. You know, the fact that now we know there are Arabic-speaking communities all along, you know, even during the 9th century, the coast, the port cities of southern China. I mean, that's extraordinary, you know. That's really, really extraordinary. And you must remember this is the period before the Renaissance in Europe, you know, when we are talking almost about the Dark Ages, you know, but yet along the sea, you have these. And what I did, and also it clarified uh, along, of course, Southeast Asia and India was, was along the root of these two empires. And so it clarified again also how along the trade routes you had these incredible sort of political, economic, and cultural centers uh, developing that was nourished by, by trade. So the story is beginning to fit together that actually it's very clear that globalization is not a new concept. It didn't even come uh, following the, 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 the breakthrough of the Portuguese shippers much later, that even at this period, that you could build uh, sea-going vessels that could travel so far. And that reconstructed ship, the Jewel of Muscat, the Omanese government built that ship and sailed it to Singapore to prove that it, it could be done, at least, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. So currently, all these objects that yeah. you showed in the yeah. presentation, yeah. Uh, they are now at the, um, the Asian Civilization yes. Museum in Singapore. Yes. And can you explain how Singaporean government or the National Heritage Foundation yeah. got involved with this project? Yeah, uh, there's, there's some controversy over the way it was recovered because Southeast Asia, the governments don't actually have proper marine archaeological teams. So what they did was they appointed a German salvage company they licensed the company to, to salvage the works. And then uh, also primarily because they had no, uh, you know, it's very expensive to try and conserve and preserve and display all of these materials. So the whole thing was sold to the government of Singapore so that primarily it, it would be taken care of and of course that it would be made available for scholars and for people to, the, the general public to look at permanently. That it will not be dispersed, you know, it will not be resold in the market and so on. And Indonesia actually took, I think it's 6,000 pieces uh, as a kind of representative example. So a very small number of pieces and actually it's, it's now on display in a new sort of facility in the capital in Jakarta. But the bulk of it uh, the most important pieces are in a gallery in the Asian Civilizations Museum by the river, uh, at the, the, the mouth of the river to the sea, uh, on permanent uh, sort of display. Mm. So uh, that's the conversation yeah. that we had in the classroom. Yeah. Like uh, when you excavate this type of cultural property, who owns it and you know, who uh, sort of disseminates yes. those materials yeah. to the general public. Yeah. But I think yeah. what Singaporean government uh, stepped in is uh, sort of a pretty uh, admirable uh, yeah. in keeping those traditions alive. Yeah. Um, so, uh, oh, yes. speaking of uh, uh, like uh, questions, uh, why don't we yeah. ask, you know, get some questions from yeah. students because they are eager to participate <laughs> here. So, uh, anybody uh, have some uh, comments or questions about the presentation? Uh, let's start to yeah. with the, yeah, on the left, I mean, hand that we can see. Um, is this on? Okay. Uh, today, uh, consumers seem to be more fixated with the brand rather than the good itself. So, you know, in these times, there obviously were an established brands that were making these beautiful items. So what sort of intangible markers did consumers have to determine whether the goods they were getting were really the top of the line or the best of the best? Um, I think it's like with, for many parts of Asia and, and Europe, the Chinese porcelain was clearly a kind of luxury good uh, because one, it was produced very far away. You had to wait very long for it to come. And um, you know, those of us that work 
in curating, we always say there is a kind of gradation, like the finest export porcelain was always to Japan, Korea, uh, the Islamic world, particularly later the Ottoman, uh, you know, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and then it goes to Europe, mm. and Southeast Asia, for example, gets the really common stuff. So there is, and, and con the consumers knew that. They knew there was a kind of gradation of, of what, what, it, you know, what is an everyday good. So in this rack, therefore, that's why you see the, the difference in the proportion. The high value, like the white wares, uh, which I showed, is a very small quantity. You know, the green wares are more, the brown wares, the tea bowls, which are more, uh, which are actually usable, you know, for everyday use. You had 50,700 pieces of them. So it's the same as now, that one, one way in which you mark yourself as really at the higher echelons of a luxury hierarchy is to have very small quantities of them. You have to wait very long for them. You know, and in this case, sometimes, as I said, it doesn't appear. <laughs> so the story, strangely enough, is a very old story. Any, any, any ideas? Okay. I have uh, two questions, one auxiliary out of curiosity and the other one relevant. Uh, so you mentioned that the Tang Dynasty was the least Han. Uh, is that the case even though the Yuan and the Qing Dynasties were both foreign run? Uh, ah, foreigners. Yeah. Uh, what I want to say, uh, I think it's primarily because it was the dynasty that was, for one of a better word, more, most cosmopolitan, you know, and it, it, it had, also particularly because the court and elite, it had a taste for, for new things, you know. So it's when you see paintings of exotic animals, of foreigners that were there. And you must remember this was the height of like both, not just the land silk route, but also the maritime silk route. So you get lots of different types of people from different parts of the world milling around. It wasn't a homogenous uh, time, you see. So you, you, like in the port cities, you didn't just see Chinese. And, and you, you had foreign merchants just staying in hotels. They'll be there for literally a year. I mean, if the monsoon is wrong, you are literally stuck there uh, for quite a long time, you know. And, and I think there has been a discovery of, of even stone inscriptions in, in uh, what is now stone inscriptions in one of the southern ports that is actually in Arabic. Now they've discovered actually it's an Arabic sort of inscription, again, indicating that you had foreign talent, so to speak, uh, in, in those cities. So I think it's more that it was a very diversified culture. Gotcha. And then uh, also, can you talk a little bit about the state of the, I guess, the institutions for financing? If, the, if there was, you know, these really these big, uh, big voyages, that's yeah. probably a lot of upfront liability and such. And was there, yeah. was there any system in place to kind of facilitate that? And then was also a little bit about the currency at the time. I mean, I I think it's all free. It's all free, free wheeling. Uh, it's probably this ship now. The uh, the current thinking is probably financed by a consortium of Arab traders. So it's a group of them because it's very very expensive. It's a very expensive. Of course, if you made it back, you could make a tremendous amount of money, you know, the fact that the weight, the gold was actually sold by weight, you know, rather than design on it. I think it, it, it shows that there was a clear kind of idea of how much certain things cost, you know, it's, it's calibrated very precisely, it's not an approximate uh, thing. And, and basically, uh, you know, these objects, particularly the, the high-end porcelain and the gold and silver, they, 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 they are literally also functioning as currency in a single, in a certain sense, you see. So any other? Oh. Sorry, I can't really see you. Hello. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, like who are making these things, like uh, bowls and stuff? Like, because they're being mass produced, 
And like, were they, did they have like a status as like artists or craftsmen or something? Or were they just like iPhone makers of today? No, it's, <laughs> it's specialized. I mean, it, that's the reason why China it was, you know, the, the center of ceramic production in the world because it's, it's a highly specialized craft that's made in certain specific locations that had access to certain types of clay. So in this, in this uh, find, there, are, there is at least material from four different kilns from both the north and the south of China, which also means there was an internal system of ordering. There was an internal distribution and collecting system because everything had to be sourced, you know, some from quite far away in northern China because, you know, that's where those things were made. And then it was brought down to this particular port. So it, it means that even within China, it, it was a very highly developed commercial system of product collecting, of ordering, of distribution. I think. And in, in relation to uh, factory, yeah, any other questions? Oh, she has the first, okay. Um, so today's consumer is very interested on how the product was made or how like the company, the, heri the heritage of the company. How do you think the consumers back then when they bought these luxury goods, how did they connect in order to buy the product? How did they what? How they connect with the product in order for it to, um, to buy the product if like the heritage wasn't as far as how we are now? Um, I think, well, these things were status symbols then and there was a clearly articulated like what kind of where and what color was was rarer and more and um, it's not very clear but I suppose some these kilns at that time were also the kilns that were some of them were also making uh, the similar material for the imperial court you know so so you know imperial porcelain we always speak of you will make 100 and break 99 because only one out of the hundred is perfect it has to be perfect so I think that kind of association you could speculate could have been you know, known to at least domestic, the, the people domestically that were involved in the trade. But I think around the world, you must remember it was the fashion, like Chinese porcelain to have these shiny white things. It meant you have arrived, you know, because they were so scarce, you had to wait so long for them, you know. Hi, Mr. Tan. I have two questions. Um, my first question is, um, you know how you said in the ninth century China was like the factory of the world, and today yeah. it still is. Um, are there okay. like geographical or political or socio-economical reasons as to why China has maintained its status as being like a factory for the whole like the world? I think it's the the organization of production and and labor. Frankly, you know that that it. Course, there's a lot of hands to work on but you know for very long they were very the artisanal tradition is extremely strong and highly developed and different parts of China like why the porcelain is different in different parts is because they were using particular properties of the clay in that in that area but the organization of production is extremely efficient and developed like with the brownware, the tea bowls, you know, you could see they were churning it out, but yet they could vary within that, that model such that there is some design difference in each, each piece, even though essentially each piece is the same sort of bowl, you know, or the same glaze, the same uh, sort of size. So it has to do, I think, with the sophistication in organizing uh, production lines uh, in a certain way, you know. And, and, the, and, and there is something to be said about producing in huge quantities la, because you, you flood, you flood, yeah, the economies of scale, you actually flood uh, the market, so to speak, in, at certain points. You know. Because um, nowadays, um, in a way, China's, um, when things are made in China, there's a reputation of it being kind of like a lower quality. Usually people think of luxury as being, you know, made in France, made in yeah. Italy. So nowadays, do you think 
it like that industry has evolved to become like this sort of mass produced lower quality or is there still this existing uh, luxurious industry I don't still? think China wants to stay as a kind of mass pr producing mass producer of of you know lower quality items they will they are they will move up the value chain and the interesting thing is they have the skills you know case after case in every century you know at particular points if they really want to they can do it you know it's not just an artistic thing it's also because they have historically uh, they can do these complex production lines these complex atelier type uh, kind of ways of producing you know goods thank you Any other, anybody? Oh, one, the one in the um, hi, um, so you mentioned that it was a lot easier to transport large quantities of, of uh, goods such as like the 60, 50 something thousand brownware. Um, yeah. But in the case of this specific cup, for example, that you said was worth 10 years of salary for yeah. a specific official, why was that chosen to be on the maritime route where you know, you could possibly capsize versus taking the Silk Road where for sure it would be longer, but there was a higher chance that, you know, it wouldn't have been capsized or you wouldn't even know what happened to it at all because all the sailors were shipwrecked with the, the ship. Mm. Um, it's difficult to answer that question. I'm not, I'm not sure the land route is safer. Oh, uh, sorry. The reason why at this point in time, the maritime silk route became very important is because of political instability. So the border regions are very unstable. Uh, um, so that possibly, I think, is a kind of factor. And the other is because on a ship, you can just bring more. Instead of bringing one, you can bring, in this case, 30 pieces, you know. But this political instability is a very important issue yeah. because uh, around the 750, Tang yeah. Dynasty had yes. a you know, major civil yes. war yeah. so that the land route that they were maintaining yes. up to the you know, middle of the 8th century, which, which was working really well, yeah. is not sustainable anymore. So sustainable. And you can be actually robbed on the way to your like, uh, you know, town you know, next to yours. Yeah. Uh, so that's why actually maritime, uh, you know, yeah, the route became more popular. Mm. And also um, you can also emphasize why those uh, the ceramic wares are superior to to other types of earthenware because uh, I don't know how many of you actually held that uh, high temperature fire the, uh, the ceramic ware or porcelain ware but it, you know the tactile quality is very seductive yeah. isn't it like yeah. uh, it's thin yeah. and it's light yeah. and because of this uh, you know the glass glazing on the surface yeah. it's shiny in all matters it's really really like a luxurious and nice yeah. uh, the way you drive your luxury car and then you feel the leather seat <laughs> and you know it's like an Italian handmade leather yeah. seat that kind of feeling yeah. right that there yeah. is a certainly you know amazing like uh, values attached yeah. to um, to the users of this wear yeah. right and also mm. there was a kind of comparative advantage because only China had that particular kind of white clay exactly. mm -hmm. at that time and of course the kiln technology to fire to such high temperatures and be able to control the temperature uh, you know reliably I think that really helped I mean it took Europe until forever <laughs> many centuries later before they could get the same sort of white uh, glossy uh, look and of course the a lot there's a lot of people who admire and you see this in the historical record also the transparency mm -hmm. the yes. thinness of some of the wares which which you know only the chinese could do you know so when you talk about the luxury, usually uh, the criteria is it's rare, right? Yeah. It's expensive. Yeah. Um, and then uh, also it's a monopoly of technology. Yes. I mean, it's, it's a high level yeah. of uh, tech, you know, uh, workmanship. Yes. And it's actually ceramic has all of those. So even yeah. though you have technique, you don't have the clay. Yes. <laughs> or you have the clay, but you don't have the, techni the technology. And actually when you talk about the uh, Chinese blue and white ceramic, like a porcelain, uh, the, the blue part is actually cool 
cobalt, yes. the mineral, yes. and it actually comes from Afghanistan from or those East, West Asia. So yeah. uh, you know, there is if there is no trade, there is no product like yeah. such. Uh, yeah. You know, white, yeah. Uh, yeah. blue and white. Yeah. Porcelain. So blue and white is an example of re-export mm -hmm. because the blue is not from China; it's from mm -hmm. you know, like Persia, from Iran, for instance. So it had to be imported into China. The Chinese will fire them into the blue and white and resell them back. <laughs> to the, so we always talk about that as a kind of re-export uh, by enhancing the value of, of you know, what was originally just a raw uh, kind of material. And also in the Arab world, there was imitations of Lots Chinese of, like porcelain yeah. as well because they own the cobalt. If yeah. they have a lot, then they, why don't we make some of those? But yeah. as you can see in the museums, they never create such a light sky blue clarity yeah. in blue. And the white, uh, they so, can't uh, get the white. Yeah, the white is more yeah. like ivory, yeah. like a white. And then the blue is more like a grayish, like a dull blue. So that again, it cannot compete with the Chinese monopoly of uh, blue and white porcelain. Yeah. Uh, but now let's move a little bit to the modern period yeah. because you know there are international trade and marketing students, uh, and uh, you know as you mentioned in the Renaissance, uh, because of the European discovery of new land, yeah. uh, the Philippine, and then uh, you know the Manila. Uh, and then Acapulco Galleon was another very yeah. popular trade, uh, you know, mean. And actually, uh, uh, on November 1st, if you are free, you can come to uh, a talk uh, called Made in Americas. Uh, we are going to have uh, curator Denise Carr of the Museum of Fine Arts. And they talk, uh, I mean, he's going to talk about a trade yeah. across the Pacific Ocean, the yeah. other side. Yeah. So um, in Southeast Asia uh, and, you know, Southern Chinese products versus, uh, you know, consumers in new, uh, Spain, mm. uh, Mexico, and mm. you know Peru, and these mm. places. Um, so, uh, what's your perspective on a little bit of early modern period? Mm. I, I think it follows the. Uh, it's very clear now that when the Europeans, you know, starting from the coming of the Portuguese, came to uh, Asia, basically what happened was they took over. Uh, sometimes by coercion, they took over the long distance trading routes that the Asian traders used to do. So they, they left the, the Asian sort of cities or empires to deal with the local regional routes that will feed into the, the international route. So that's basically what happened. But at the same time, the story is strikingly similar. Like the Philippines exported, Manila exported a lot of silver, silverware, but a lot of them are actually made by Chinese, mm. you know, in the Philippines, you know, who, who late, and it's very difficult to trace because they all converted to Catholicism. And in essence, you know, a lot of times were indistinguishable from the, the, the indigenous population. But the Philippines was actually ruled by Spain almost as a province of Mexico, you know, so you would go go yeah, this side. way, you know, and, and that has a lot of repercussions, not just in terms of, but also how we understood it, how we, how we get at it, you know, I did an exhibition with the British Museum before, and I asked to find one Filipino item, I said, can I get an ivory crucifix? I said, this is a Catholic country, there must be, and I and they said, we don't have it because the Americans and the Spanish were there, and, all that. and lo and behold, you know, they found one in the Spanish department that had been classified as Spanish art. But when we looked at it, we said it's Chinese ivory from <laughs> Manila. You know, it's clearly Chinese ivory from Manila. So I, I think the scale of it is still yet to be fully sort of excavated, you know, because even some of the evidences we have with the Philippine material, it could be masquerading or has been masqueraded as European mm -hmm. material when actually it's coming from this place in, in, uh, in uh, uh, you know, Asia, in Southeast Asia. So again, you know, the idea that people from that global trade always at which period had different kinds of people from different cultures coming together, you had for once and purposes, expatriate populations, you know, your foreign talent, and you had, you know, in a sense, cultural aesthetic borrowing that, that you will borrow from each other, you will imitate each other. It's never a kind of one-way thing, you know. Like, like this, you know, the desire for Chinese 
blue and white or Chinese porcelain stimulated development in, in a sense, you know, earthenware, for example, development in, in the Middle East as the potters tried to invent new ways to imitate mm -hmm. uh, the look of Chinese uh, porcelain. So it's not, I think the story is the same, that it's not a zero-sum game mm -hmm. and that it's a creative kind of process of bouncing back and forth. And I do have to say, it becomes very clear that the blue and white, when it first appeared back in the Arab world, in the Middle East, within the span of 10 years, you see the uh, Arabs reacting or the, the Persians reacting to the Chinese and the Chinese reacting back, they would adapt again. And it's very fast. Within the span of 10 years, you can see mm -hmm. the, the, the design starting to bounce back and forth, you know, even without the internet. So that was very uh, interesting yeah. story, and you know I saw the high-end luxury and yeah. affordable luxury in a yeah. way the brown ware that you showed. Yeah. So there are ranges of products. Yeah, That's very interesting to clearly. me too. Yeah. And then like, you have one of a kind of like gold, gold bowls, yeah. right? Um, and um, uh, you know, moving on to the more uh, modern period, do you have any other questions uh, about uh, you know practitioners of art and designs and? Um, hi, so how do you see the relationship between Asian and Western art developing in regards to their respective selling prices at the leading auction houses of today? <laughs> <laughs> I knew someone was going to ask that question. You actually talked a little bit about contemporary yeah. artists yeah. from South uh, Asia yeah. and Southeast yeah. Asia, so uh, yeah. maybe that's a good starting point. Yeah. I think the art market uh, had a major readjustment in 2008 following the financial crisis. Uh, but what has happened now is that it, in Asia, it has recovered quite spectacularly. In China, for instance, I think the big development is that art collecting has evolved out of not just uh, Beijing and Shanghai, but to the other provinces you are beginning to get. So if you imagine the size of China, when you suddenly have the entry into the market of these kinds of you know, people who have so much disposable income and they aspire to, for example, recover parts of their heritage that have been lost to America or Europe or other parts of Asia, as well as you know, the new contemporary art and design things, it, it, it's a very big shift. There will be a global impact on the entire geography. And we can see that because now the Chinese collectors are also collecting Western art. So, you know, like, just like in the 80s, the Japanese were obsessed with the Impressionists and they bought all the, the Impressionists, some of which are coming out now. So I think the same thing will happen, you know, um, not just Asian, but particularly American and European uh, material, you know, the great early 20th century uh, works will, will start, you will find them, uh, you know, regularly being, in a sense, exported uh, into China. And China is building 1,000 museums. Mm -hmm. I mean, 1,000 museums, and, as well as private museums. And you have to understand with private uh, museums uh, that China has a very active system of mortgaging art as collateral. Mm -hmm. So with regard to your question of prices, what does that mean? It means several things. It, one of the implications is that auctions become very important. What appears in the big pages or the front cover, back cover become very important because if you, if you are thinking of your art as an asset class that could be collateralized, mm -hmm. then you need a public price not a private gallery price, but a price that the newspaper, the New York Times will report, that is the value of that work. So one of the, the, the implications could be, in a sense, which is why they buy a lot in public auctions. You see, you see them buying a lot in public auctions uh, for that. So there will be a global shift, particularly now that they have started to collect Western art you know, to put, I mean, you will see. Just like what happened with America after the war, when America, 
you know, and our great museums are in, in, in the city are partly the result of that, of, of Americans, you know, internalized all the masterpieces, there will be a movement back, I think. Mm. And, but the prices will be high because... Mm. Speaking of the auction house, yeah. you know, those old Chinese blue and white, oh. um, you know, those uh, precious porcelain uh, objects, they also have life uh, in the secondary market and yes. uh, auction houses. Um, so, uh, you know, day after day, they, you know, sometimes they hit the record high price over and over again. And uh, so there are a lot of values attached to these uh, ancient objects as yes. well. Uh, yes. Chinese, you know, wealthy buyers, uh, of course, they buy uh, contemporary artworks as well, but then yeah. they also invest a lot in those uh, ancient uh, antiquities as yeah. well so that they have uh, like rarities. Uh, yeah, because right? of scarcity. Mm -hmm. And you know, for a very long time with Chinese porcelain, Ming and Qing uh, porcelains were very popular because they, you know, aesthetically they are a bit more diverse, but also because they are the ones that have imperial marks, mm -hmm. like which it was made under the reign of which emperor. So conversely, the, for a long time, the earlier things like the Song uh, ceramics and so on were, were not as expensive as, as the, the sort of later imperial wear. But now that market is very tight already. So you can see people are going back in time further and further. You know? so, so those prices will start going up. So again, the same thing about branding applies, you know, because the imperial mark is a branding. Everybody wants a, a Qianlong piece, you know, everybody must have a Qianlong piece because he's like the great collector emperor of the Qing dynasty, he's a scholar uh, and so on. So it, it, it's, it's, it's the same, you see. But I think in contemporary art is where you will get a lot of volatility, uh, I think. Mm. In my own study of uh, you know, um, collectors of Asian art in the US, mm. uh, for example, JP Morgan mm. used to buy a lot of Chinese porcelain. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the seller uh, to uh, JP Morgan was Joseph Duvin, a mm. Jewish art dealer from France. Mm. And whenever he sends a list of artworks to sell to Mr. Morgan, um, Chinese porcelain always has this quotation mark called the Kangxi. Kangxi. Yeah. And as we all know, that's the name of Kangxi Emperor of yeah. Qing Dynasty. And obviously, not all the porcelain owned by Emperor Kangxi, mm. but uh, those, uh, those are really like a sort of a brand name <laughs> to yeah. Mr. Morgan. So he used to buy the whole collection of porcelain yeah. sent by Mr. Dubin. Yeah. So there is certain like, values attached to yeah. And uh, also to because the, Kang, the rain it was very specific, so it's mm. very rare. There is imperial, like uh, yeah. the seal mark yes. under the ceramic yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, uh, is there any other question about the more contemporary period? What about di diaspora of people? <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, you're here. In the front. Uh, hi, uh, I'm a marketing major student. So do you consider China as the oldest uh, luxury brand? And like people when they're buying things from China because it's from China? Or like who is actually buying these things? Like they use it for daily use? and for their life, or they just, because it's from China, I want to have it and, and use it to display or to show other people. Mm. My view is that not yet is developing. I mean, it's developing very fast, you know. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it seems to be that the early successes internationally seem to be diasporic talent, you know, diasporic artists and and designers that have a base uh, in the West in particular. But I think it's only a matter of time before it happens. Like for example, you know, uh, architecture is, you know, the, the young Chinese architects are very, very interesting. And people in that field do, do talk about how there's something sort of going on. I think in interior, products like decorative items for the home is one area. Uh, if you go even to Shanghai now, you know, you, you, you begin to see these atelier, small atelier type products that are really fine. And, and you know, once I saw these kinds of blue and white 
uh, teaware and so on, and they were telling me they are exporting it to, for example, to be sold at the Palace Museum in, in Taipei, you know, where it's very, it's quite expensive for what it is, but it's, it's very small batch production. I think it will, it will get there, you know. It's just that now, I think the, the sort of consumer good production so dominates the, and also the volumes are so large, we, we sometimes lose sight of what is bubbling, uh, I think, underneath, you know. Because there are many, many uh, experiments that are going on in, in China, like, uh, for example, the Sifang Museum, you know, it's a private museum by a particular sort of business family in China. And the museum is famous because it's a huge property and they commission permanent installations in the landscape. But when you say it's a museum, actually it's a spa. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a real spa. You go there to, to de-stress and chill, you know. So they are finding very, and, and in a sense, it's quite unique because it's land art. It's not something you can take out and put in the mm -hmm. auction. It's there permanently, but they've pioneered a, a kind of very interesting fusion, you know, in terms of how a, a, a kind of lifestyle concept that is, that is going on. And it's a destination. It's not in the city or whatever. You have to make the decision to go there. But when you do go there, it's the most beautiful place you've, you've ever seen. And there's going to be a hotel and things like that. So it's an interesting. They are doing, I think, interesting kind of concepts. And there will be more and more of them. So in relation to the student's question, like uh, uh, up to early modern period, what it means of China or association with China usually meant luxury in a way, like uh, the goods are usually uh, export items. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like manufactured, I mean, the handcrafted Handicraft. items are usually Actually, associated with China. And that's yeah. why even in our uh, English uh, vocabulary, we call China for any type of ceramic yeah. ware. Uh, yeah. You know, it's the name yeah. uh, representing yeah. uh, the special technique yeah. and as you were saying maybe in 30 years China is going to be actually producer of uh, like a luxury items where can you find yeah. that so many skillful uh, craftsmen yeah. uh, you know in this world yeah. uh, and uh, Jingda Zen for example the center of white porcelain in China they actually manufacture a lot of uh, limited edition items for yes. European uh, tableware uh, companies like a Christopher yes. or whenever you make a limited editions yeah. uh, with the new designs they go to Jingda Zen because yeah. they can find the most gifted yeah. uh, artisans. They yeah. are not even masters, but you know, like tens and thousands of yeah. them actually working in yeah. that village, yeah. right? So now they are more like the suppliers to the luxury mm. brands, but you can imagine very soon they will say, I want to stick my own label mm. on it because you know, I'm mm. actually the one doing it. You know, like, like with a lot of the table service now, the finest ones are actually made by the, you know, Kyung Hee says the artisans in Jing Zhen. It's just that it's, it's a European brand that has the, the right. label on it. But right. it will come off and it may be sooner than we, we think, you know. Go to China. <laughs> Go to China. And the other reason is because the resources there to make these kinds of, even what is in the land and, and, and the material, the wood and all that, is quite unique, you see, like what we see with the porcelain, with the particular kind of clay they have. So it's a, it's a, I mean, cities, especially Shanghai, I think for design, there is, uh, there is something very interesting uh, going on, you know, that I think everybody should be investigating because otherwise it will come upon us and blink and we, <laughs> we would have missed the boat. And to pick up on Mr. Tan's invitation to China, we do have a study abroad program mm. to Donghua <laughs> University. Yes. And Alicia, you want to say a few words? So do take advantage of that. It's offered in the spring, every spring. Mm. Go. Go, yeah. So it was a great opportunity Thank to you. invite you and then, uh, you know, international trade and marketing students and liberal arts students all together yeah. talk about the future of luxury as well as the past. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's thank uh, Mr. Tan for coming to FIT.
And then, uh, if you want to take a pictures with him, you can come to the stage and take a picture and, and show up on your Instagram. And then, uh, so on the way out, there are flyers for other events. So, uh, you know, you are welcome to come on November 1st, uh, the curator Dennis Carr about the Made in the Americas. It's uh, the other part of luxury trade. Yeah. Good luck for your exams. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, you knew that they have exams. <laughs> yeah.